Okay, so we are now back. <laughs> All right. Um, right before we took our break, I was reading aloud <coughs> Blake's poem, the, uh, the Little Black Boy. Now, once again, as I said before the break, what we need to pay attention to here is the persona in the poem. We actually have two voices, but the principal voice is that of the little boy, the little black boy. And once again, the little black boy has been taken advantage of in all kinds of ways that we're about to talk about. And as in earlier cases, such as the chimney sweep poem, the child is not fully aware and that's part of the irony, and that's part of the poignancy of the poem. The child is not completely aware of the extent to which he has been taken advantage of. Look at this. My, my mother bore me in the southern wild. The southern wild, of course, being Africa, obviously. And I am black, but oh, my soul is white. And notice that already... Not only is he distinguished between blackness and whiteness, but notice the but here. You see, I am black, but, but, oh, my soul is white. See what that implies already? Is that, that, that black is inferior and white is superior. I, my skin may be black, but hey, look, my, my soul is white, so I must be okay. Okay, uh, white as an angel is the English child. Okay, here's the little, the little black boy now who's looking at the English child and saying, my God, he's like an angel. But I am black as if bereaved of light. As if bereaved of light, a child of darkness. Okay, rather than a child of light. I mean, this is all biblical imagery too, isn't it? And then, of course, my mother taught me, and what did uh, his mother teach him? My mother taught me this, this very simple but very good uh, natural religion. Okay? And we are put on earth a little space that we may learn to bear the beams of love and these black bodies and this sunburned face is but a cloud and like a shady grove. See, the body is not the true reality. It's like a cloud in the sense that it's not really real. It's not really solid. And when the body passes away, the spirit will remain. And it's the spirit that will go into some kind of everlasting life and into heaven and so on and so on. Okay. And thus did my mother say and kissed me. And thus I say to little English boy. And notice, by the way, the syntax that's used here. Blake is even trying to imitate the syntax of an African-born boy, okay, speaking English. When I from black and he from white cloud free, the, the cloud again being the flesh, the body, when we're free, and round the tent of God like lambs we joy. Again, lambs, right? What will I do? I being the black boy now. I'll shade him from the heat. I'll shade him from the heat. I will be his servant even in heaven, by the way. I'll shade him from the heat till he can bear to lean on joy, in joy upon our father's knee. And then I'll stand and stroke his silver hair. I'll stand and stroke his silver hair. Because that's what's beautiful, you see. Not my black hair, but his silver hair. That's what's really beautiful. And be like him, and he will then love me. See, it's not that he could love me now. 
as I am a little black boy, or even then until I have performed services for him. But only then, after I have performed the service for him, even in heaven, and stroked his silver hair, because that's what's beautiful, not my black hair, but his, his silver hair. And then I will be like him, and he will then love me. Now, I remember Martin Luther King one time making a very, very, very interesting point. Uh, he said that one of the most horrible things to watch was when a child, a small child, isn't aware of color or race and so forth, but at some point, a child will actually become aware that there's some kind of a difference there. I mean, it's not just that we look different, but I mean, that's no big deal. I mean, some of us are taller or shorter or darker or lighter or men or women or whatever. But, you know, the child doesn't really think about those things in the way that adult culture does until the child is taught to think about those things the way adult culture does. And what Dr. King was talking about was there's, there's that terrible moment when you look and you realize that the child realizes not only that he or she is different, but that he is looked down upon or she is looked down upon for being different. And see, that's the kind of thing that's happening in this poem. I mean, that would be tough enough for adults to deal with. But imagine that from the perspective of a child. And that's what this poem is really about. Now, at this time, England was probably the largest uh, 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 entity involved in the African slave trade. And even when they made slavery illegal in England, they didn't make it illegal to conduct the slave trade. So there were English slave traders who went to Africa and uh, who bought slaves, bought Africans, and, and took them over to the Caribbean, in some cases to places in the southern United States, but often enough to, put, to ports in the Caribbean and so forth, from which obviously slaves were then transported to other places. Uh, and so, of course, what Blake is doing here is he's drawing our attention to the evils of that kind of social practice. And one of the ways of doing that would be to get up and give a thunderous sermon or political speech. Another way is to write this kind of a poem. And you'd have to be hard-hearted indeed not to be touched by this poem and by the plight of the child in this poem. OK, so once again, Blake not only ahead of his time, but also not really recognized very much in his own time. Uh, now, let me also be clear about something. Blake, yes, of course, was a person of conscience, but there were other people in England who were people of conscience, just as there were people of conscience in the United States and elsewhere who thought that the slave trade was horrible and, and sinful and immoral and evil. Uh, but it took a while for them ultimately to prevail. And again, it probably comes back to the kind of point that I was talking about, how you can sometimes have people who are ahead of their time, as Blake clearly was. And we now look back and we say, well, yeah, sure. But in his own time, he would have been, as we sometimes say, swimming against the current. Not for everybody. Not for everybody, but for many. OK, let's look at the sick rose. We're now going to look at. Uh, final three poems that are very different from what we have been looking at. One of the things that 
Blake was also very much ahead of his time in was he was opposed to what he felt were very, very, very unwholesome, unhealthy attitudes towards sex and sexuality. We're going to see that in the next couple of poems. The Sick Rose. The Rose, by the way, uh, going back at least into the Middle Ages, maybe even farther back than that, uh, has been used as a symbol for female sexuality in particular. There's the runaway bestseller in the Central and later Middle Ages was a French work called Le Roman de la Rose, uh, the Romance of the Rose, in which the, the central symbol of the rose stands for woman, but particularly for woman's sexuality. Uh, and of course, that has everything to do with uh, rose symbolism, you know, in later literature, uh, the giving of roses, you better give the right kind of rose uh, because of the symbolic nature of roses. Remember uh, Shakespeare in his famous Sonnet 130 uh, says, if my love, if my lady loves uh, uh, cheeks are like roses, uh, they are damasked red and white. Okay, in other words, they're not pure red, they're not pure white, but they are a mixture of the, uh, of the two. Uh, you can play with this kind of imagery and this kind of symbolism in all sorts of ways if you want to. Well, here we have Blake. O rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Now, I don't think that I have to explain to any adult uh, the kind of near blatant sexual uh, symbolism that we have in this poem, right? But what he's suggesting here and elsewhere is that we have sick ideas about sex. It's not that sex is sick but that we have sick ideas about sex, or at least have had. I mean, maybe we're emerging from some of those. Let's hope so. Uh, but at least we have had. Now here, once again, you know, Blake is obviously way ahead of his time in talking about something like that. Okay, and then let's move along to the Garden of Love which even more directly makes this point. I went to the Garden of Love, another very conventional symbol, going back at least to the Roman de la Rose, you know, which you have the rose in an enclosed garden. And of course, what the lover wants to do is he wants to get into the garden so that he can possess the rose. I went to the Garden of Love and saw what I had I never had seen. Notice how he will sometimes put words, not out of order, because English is pretty flexible about word order, but put them in a, in a place in the sentence where you have to stress it more than you think you would otherwise. Normally we would say, and saw what I, uh, and saw what never I had seen, or I had never seen, or something like that. But he has, and saw what I never had seen. So there's a special emphasis on never. A chapel was built in the midst. A chapel in the midst of the Garden of Love? Where I used to play on the green. Now there's a chapel there. And the gates of this chapel were shut. And thou shalt not writ over the door. This is the chapel in the Garden of Love which has, thou shalt not. So I turned to the garden of love that so many sweet flowers bore, and I saw it was filled with graves. I saw it was filled with graves. And tombstones where flowers should be, and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds, and binding with briars my joys and desires. Okay, thorn bushes, you see. 
which of course would not only bind you, but in the process would inflict pain, physical pain. As a constant reminder, thou shalt not indulge in the joys and the flyer, uh, the joys and desires amidst the flowers of the Garden of Love. Well, again, we've talked about Blake as a rebel, right? Well, he's a rebel not only in his art and in his politics and in his social attitudes, but also in his attitudes towards the church as well as the state. Okay? That doesn't mean that he's irreligious. He's one of the most profoundly religious poets, not only of his time, but of all time. I mean, he was a profoundly religious man. We're not reading some of that poetry, but he was a mystic. He was a religious mystic. And he wrote poems that were visionary, prophetic poems that drew upon these kinds of mystical, visionary experiences that he had of some kind of transcendent realms beyond this one. So, I mean, it would be outrageously unfair to say that he's, he's irreligious. He's just opposed to certain kinds of institutional religion, which he felt would be hypocritical, okay, and, uh, and, and, and really uh, destroy the better parts of human nature. Well, then we get to London. Remember what I've said about the romantics and urbanization and so forth. I wander through each chartered street. And what he's doing is, here's the poet who is walking through the streets of London. And he's seeing and he's hearing different things. Okay? It's a very interesting device because he's, he's on the move. It's like the, the Harlem Renaissance poet Langston Hughes is a very interesting poem in which uh, in the summertime in Harlem, people have their windows open, you know, because it's hot. And so he can hear all of the voices with different African-American dialects coming to him floating on the air from the different apartments from the perspective where he's sitting. That's the same kind of device that Blake is using here, though obviously fashioned in a different way. Okay, I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet what? Of all the people I meet on the street. Marks of weakness, marks of woe. He's walking down toward the river, and this would be obviously where some of the poorer parts of, of the city are, too. In every cry of every man, and man capitalized here means man and woman. I mean, it's the older usage of the word man. It doesn't just mean males. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear. Infant's cry of fear? Not joy, not laughter. In every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear. That's a very famous phrase. Mind forged manacles. You know what manacles are, right? What are manacles? Manacles? What are manacles? Handcuffs, Handcuffs would be one example of manacles. Um, okay. Mind forged we could have manacles on our minds, on our spirits, that were forged by people's minds or spirits. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. This is England out, you know, attacking much of the rest of the world to try to conquer it. But most through midnight streets I hear 
how the youthful harlots curse. The youthful, she's youthful too. The youthful harlots curse. Blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage hearse. I mean, once again, this is strong, strong medicine, as the saying goes. But most through midnight streets I hear, not just the youthful harlot, but the youthful harlot's curse, blasting the newborn infant's tear. Newborn infant, apparently unwanted child, right? And blights with plagues, and get this, the marriage hearse? The marriage hearse? I mean, my God, uh, talk about the social evils of the time. You know, he wants to push our faces into them here. This is no longer the subtle kind of strategy that he was using with his personae of children, for whom we can feel profound sympathy and want to change their way of life and their conditions of living. This is something much more direct. Okay, this is a real attack. Okay, so a very, very interesting poet. If you like Blake, there's a lot more to Blake, not only in our anthology, but you can go on. You can look at, as I've said, some of his uh, paintings and engravings, as well as some of his poetry. If you really, really get turned on by Blake, you might want to uh, look into some of his prophetic and even mystical poetry. It's complicated, it's difficult. You may want to have a guide to that. There are lots of good critical commentaries on it that you can find. But uh, he's a very, very interesting poet. So next, let's turn to William Wordsworth. And again, while I'm not requiring it, I encourage you to read these uh, introductory notes to each one of our authors because they'll tell you stuff about the author's life and times that otherwise you, you might not know unless you've taken a course in romantic poetry before. And we find out that Wordsworth was uh, born and grew up in the latter part of the 18th century. He was fortunate enough to grow up in a small town in the Lake District, which is a very beautiful part of England. And uh, this had a profound influence on him. His mother died when he was uh, very young, and then his father died when he was also young. And uh, he was uh, reared by a woman who took care of him and the other children. Uh, and he was sent to school, but he was also given a lot of freedom to wander around in the woods on his own. And uh, this is a practice that, uh, you know, most of us would not experience in a city. I mean, would you let your children just wander around on their own in a, in a city like Houston or, or some other big American or, or European or Latin American or African or Asian or whatever kind of city, right? Uh, cities are dangerous places, or at least they can be dangerous places. And uh, people often felt very safe letting their children just wander off into the woods. You know, because what, what kind of trouble are they going to get into in the woods? I mean, it's not that you couldn't get into trouble, but the general thought was, you know, that. They, I mean, they've got to work out this energy somehow. You know, kids have got all kinds of energy and stuff. They've got to work out that energy somehow. This is perfectly safe for them. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're not talking about playing on cliffs or, you know, in the deep ocean or anything like that. We're talking about just going off in the, in the woods here by the lake. And so Wordsworth talks in his poetry about how important that was to him in terms of his growing up experience and then is his experience as an adult. 
So uh, he went to college, he went to Cambridge University. Uh, he felt that Cambridge was in a very interesting place when he went there. And most historians will tell us, and biographers of Wordsworth will tell us, that Cambridge was not having one of its better periods at this time. And uh, things were not going, uh, let's say, in very stimulating directions. At least many people think so. And he was unimpressed by his college education. And uh, then he went back into the Lake Country for a little while. But in the meantime, he'd also taken some, uh, some tours to the European continent. Uh, and among other things was there you know, with celebrations of the French Revolution going on. He took uh, other walking tours in Wales. We'll talk more about that later on. He even had a girlfriend, Annette Vallon, when he was in France. Uh, they were going to get married along the way she became pregnant, and they had a child, but he was forced, they thought temporarily, to go back to England because uh, he didn't have any money. And he had an inheritance which was due to him, but the inheritance was all tied up in the courts. So he went back to England. Well, then war broke out between France and England. And so he wasn't able to get back. And then by the time he could get back into contact with her, years had passed. We'll talk more about this in detail later on. Years had passed. And uh, so they simply decided that they no longer really had a basis to get married. I mean, the two of them had just grown in totally different directions. He, by the way, uh, was honorable about this. He uh, recognized his child as his child, and uh, he supported the child and provided, uh, you know, his, Annette with the uh, with as much money as he could afford. And as he became more more, he didn't become super wealthy, but he, he became more prosperous as time went on. He was able to provide more and more support for the child. So, uh, so he did do the right thing by the, by the child, uh, but on the other hand, this was a really, 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 really wrenching experience in his life. And he went through almost a total emotional and mental collapse over this. What used to be called a nervous breakdown, and we now would talk about this in more catastrophic terms of a kind of mental and emotional collapse. And nowadays, he would have uh, had to go into an institution. He would have had all kinds of psychotherapy and probably psychoactive drugs and so on and so on. Those things didn't exist in his time. And so what he did was he turned to his poetry as a form of psychotherapy which is actually a very interesting uh, project. You know, writing is a, or can be, a form of psychotherapy. And as a matter of fact, people who do have psychological problems are generally encouraged to write. I mean, maybe you're not a poet, but you can write a journal, you can, you can write whatever you're capable of writing, because the very act of writing and expressing and exploring your feelings is itself therapeutic. And he eventually, fortunately, was able to work his way out of his, uh, what we would nowadays have to call an illness, uh, and you know, went on to live a very full life after that. Got married and so on and so on and so on. Okay, well, along the way, he met Samuel Taylor Coleridge another one of the very great romantic poets. And they became very, very close friends, even to the point where when one of them moved, the other one would move to a place close enough where they could still meet on a regular basis. And they would take, in the early days of their friendship, these long walks in the woods and down around the lakes and so forth, and they would talk about poetry. And they both started writing poetry. And then they set themselves a project. Coleridge talks more about this in his Biographia Literaria in a section that we're going to read a little bit later on. That they set themselves different projects. What Coleridge was going to do in this book that they were jointly going to publish called Lyrical Ballads 
What Coleridge was going to do is he was going to write poetry about things that were supranormal or even supernatural, otherworldly, otherworldly, but try to make them believable as if they were worldly happenings. Not that they were, but as if they were. And the lead poem in this book, as it turned out, was the rhyme of the ancient mariner, which everybody's encountered at some point, or at least parts of. Wordsworth had the contrary task. His was to take ordinary, everyday kinds of experiences and show how extraordinary they truly are if we really look at them and really understand them for what they are. Okay? How is it possible to be bored? Because even very ordinary things are extraordinary if you look at them in the right way. Okay. When they published the first edition of it, it sold out in a couple of years. The critics didn't all love it, but uh, there was a good audience for this poetry. And there were a lot of people who thought, this is amazing poetry. This is so different from the kind of poetry we are used to. It's amazing stuff that there was going to be a second edition. The first edition came out in 1798. Two years later, in 1800, there was a second edition. And for this, Wordsworth wrote a preface in prose in which he explained what he encouraged, but particularly what he was trying to do in his poetry. And it's very interesting. We don't have very many statements early on from poets about what they were trying to do. We have some, but not very many. Pope, for example, has his essay on criticism in which he talks about poetry. Uh, we have some sidelong glances in Shakespeare and in Chaucer where they're reflecting sometimes on the art of their poetry. But we don't have extended treatments of this the way we do in Wordsworth's preface to the second edition of Lyrical Ballads of 1800 until Wordsworth. I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of passages. And I know that not everybody is dealing with the, uh, with the same edition, so I'm going to count paragraphs. In the seventh edition, this is on page 241, but for those of you who don't have the seventh edition, it's in the one, two, three, four, Five, sixth paragraph, the sixth paragraph of the selection of the preface. Let me read this and comment on it. The principal object then, which I proposed to myself in these poems, was to choose incidents and situations from common life, just from common ordinary life. I'm not going to talk about, you know, God and the angels like Milton and Paradise Lost. I'm not going to talk about great heroic figures like in Homer and Virgil. I'm going to talk about ordinary people in ordinary life. And to relate or describe them throughout as far as possible in a selection of language really used by men. Not the highfalutin language of the poets of his time, but the real language used by real people. And at the same time, to throw over them a certain coloring of imagination, whereby ordinary things should be presented to the mind in an unusual way. Ordinary things be presented in an unusual way. And further and above all, to make these incidents and situations interesting to make them interesting by tracing in them truly, though not ostentatiously, the primary laws of our nature. From ordinary experience, maybe we can figure out some very fundamental things about human nature and how we experience the world around us as well as ourselves. Chiefly as regards the manner in which we associate ideas in a state of excitement. 
you know, when we have some kind of, of, of exciting idea, or I mean exciting experience, and, and how do we associate things at that point? What's going on in our psyches at that point? Low and rustic life was generally chosen. Low and rustic? Ordinary, commonplace, country people. Because in that condition, the essential passions of the heart find a better soil than they can attain, in which they can attain their maturity, are less under restraint and speak a plainer and more emphatic language because in that condition of life, our elementary feelings coexist in a state of greater simplicity and consequently may be more accurately contemplated and more forcibly communicated because the manners of rural life germinate from those elementary feelings. And what he's talking about basically all through this paragraph, and you know, you can read the rest of the paragraph for yourselves, is that among country people, there is a tendency for people to be much more direct in the way they speak. And they don't give way to idle sophistications. And they're much more direct in the expression of their feelings. And Wordsworth finds that very attractive. Very attractive. He's, he's tired of the the excessive sophistications of some people who are simply being artificial and trying to show off. Okay? Well then, if you will turn over a few pages, you will see in your book, in the seventh edition, this is on page 250, but in your text, this comes toward the end of the uh, selection from his preface, in which he gives one of the most famous definitions of poetry that we have ever had. I have said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. Notice he's treating poetry from the point of view of the poet and the psychology of the poet. The psychology of the poet. What the poet experiences. The spontaneous, not planned, not made up, not artificially contrived, the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. Recollected in tranquility. The writing of the poem doesn't take place in the midst of the emotional overflow. How could you write a poem and have the overflow of powerful feeling at the same time? But this is in the remembrance, the recollection afterward of that emotion in tranquility. The emotion is contemplated till by a species of reaction. The tranquility gradually disappears, and an emotion kindred, not the same as, but kindred to that which was before the subject of contemplation, is gradually produced and does itself already exist in the mind. Now, what Wordsworth means by that is, Demonstrated by a simple exercise. Everybody try this exercise. Just, you know, I'm not going to go into this in, in, at any great length. But just try this exercise for a moment. Just think about some moment in your life in which you experienced something that moved you very, very powerfully. It could be a very pleasant and joyful experience. could be a painful experience but something that really, really moved you very, very powerfully in your life. And obviously that's going to be different for each one of us. Right? Just think about that for a minute. And I'm not going to extend this too far, but 
notice what would happen if you really, really carried that out and carried it out for any length of time is that gradually the feeling begins to come back, doesn't it? Whatever that feeling was, you know, happiness, maybe disappointment, whatever the feeling was, anger, or maybe joy, for that matter. I mean, we have lots of very good feelings that are very memorable, as well as ones that are not so good. And the feeling actually begins to come back, and you can actually feel something like what it felt like when you had the original experience. It's not quite the same, but it's very much like it. His word is kindred, kindred to it. It's then that you can write a poem, according to Wordsworth. See, if you're right in the middle of the experience, I mean, how can you, how can you write about the experience? Right? Oh my God, this is so incredible. This is wonderful. I am totally awestruck by this experience. And at the same time, I'm scribbling away my poem about it. Well, unless you're somehow or another two people or perhaps truly schizophrenic, you know, it's hard to imagine how that could take place. Okay? But it's afterwards that you can draw on the experience and draw on the emotion of the experience by recollecting it at a more tranquil time in your life. Maybe sitting alone, sitting in your study, sitting wherever you might sit or stand or walk. Okay? Uh, very interesting. Coleridge also is going to expand on this and develop an even more complex notion of the psychology of poetic creation. Because that, too, is something that the Romantics are interested in. Remember now, it's not that they're not interested in objectivity in the objective world, in the usual senses in which we use those terms. But what they are is more interested than most of their predecessors in the subjective world, the subjective world of our psychological experience, and in analyzing and attempting to understand that subjective reality, and that that subjective reality can tell us a great deal about who we are and what our relations to the world around us may be. Now, in order to understand how he does that, how he actually makes use of that, let's flip over to his poem. The Tintern Abbey. Lines written a few lines uh, above uh, Tintern Abbey. And like you, unfortunately, I didn't put a uh, bookmarker in here. Sorry? 235 in this edition. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, what we're going to see, let me just anticipate this for you a little bit. What we're going to see is Wordsworth going out to this very beautiful spot, which is on the borderland between the western part of England and the eastern part, actually southeastern part of Wales. Okay, let me uh, see if I can... I love to draw maps. I'm not very good at it, but uh, I love to uh, try my hand at it. Okay, if, if you take this and you say that this is roughly what England looks like. That's really not what England looks like. But, and then Ireland, <laughs> Ireland is over here, by the way. Okay, then uh, right in roughly about there is Wales. Okay, and Tintern Abbey is roughly right about there. Okay, um, now Wordsworth had been here five years earlier. And talk about recollecting spontaneous overflow 
of emotion in tranquility. He will tell us that he has many times gone back to the experience of being a Tintern Abbey in the intervening five years. And that that has been a very, very important experience for him to draw on. And now he is returning to Tintern Abbey. And what he's doing, in effect, is he's comparing the spontaneous experience he had here five years ago with the experience that he has now, which is not only an experience of this beautiful setting, but also the remembrance of what he felt like when he was here before the first time, and how he no longer feels exactly what he felt then. And he's no longer really capable of the same kind of spontaneous feeling now that he was capable of then. It also happens that he's not alone. His younger sister, Dorothy, is out there with him. And she's just having a great time. She's rolling around in the grass and singing and dancing in the sunlight and just being great. And he's thinking with some sadness that while he's so happy for her that she's having this great spontaneous experience in nature, there's a certain amount of sadness toward the end of the poem because he realizes that he's no longer capable of that kind of spontaneity, that he's become too self-conscious. Self-conscious in the sense that, you know, we can become too self-conscious when we no longer are just having the experience, but we're watching ourselves having the experience. We're contriving to have the experience. You know, and there's a certain amount of contrivance and even maybe artificiality in that. I mean, maybe it's better than not having the experience at all, right? Like going on a vacation, right? You have to plan, most, most people anyway, have to plan to go on a vacation, especially if they've got obligations, work, family, whatever, okay? So a certain amount of planning has to go into that. But that doesn't mean that once you're actually on your vacation, you can't have some marvelous experiences. But what happens if we become so self-conscious that we're just constantly observing ourselves having the experiences we have? And maybe even, God help us, analyzing the experiences that we have. Have you ever met somebody like that? You ever done it yourself? You know, um, that's, that's the kind of thing that Wordsworth actually is feeling kind of sad about toward the end of this poem. Okay, well, having said all of that, let's look at the poem itself. Five years have passed. Oh, by the way, let me just also say this about Tintern Abbey. Uh, have any of you ever been there or know what Tintern Abbey is? Uh, it's a medieval abbey. It's, it's a uh, church and the grounds of a monastery now in ruins by the way, now in ruins. And so uh, we are reminded that in the 1530s, after Henry VIII, then king of England, proclaimed himself also the head of the Church of England, ordered the dissolution of the monasteries. What the dissolution of the monasteries really meant, it's a kind of euphemism, what it really meant was going into the monasteries and in many cases smashing, you know, the beautiful stained glass windows, smashing the heads off statues, uh, burning the libraries, the monastic libraries. The monks who wouldn't simply surrender and give in and convert to your, your church now, leave their own church and, and convert to your church. In many cases, they simply slaughtered or otherwise simply drove away uh, into a kind of exile. And these churches and monasteries from the Middle Ages, many of which are really, really beautiful, uh, were allowed to disintegrate into ruins 
over time. And in some cases, you've actually got sketches from the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. So you can see the progress of their disintegration over time. And so all over England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, the British Isles, you will find the ruins. I mean, they're very common. You will find the ruins of old churches and old monasteries. Now, another aspect of Romanticism that I had not really talked about, but it goes hand in hand with that critique of the new urbanization, industrialization, and so forth that I was talking about, was a critique of what then was regarded as modernism of the modern world. We're talking about the end of the 18th century now, the beginning of the 19th century. And there were lots of people who were looking back past the modern world to the Middle Ages and saying, you know back there in the Middle Ages? People think that it was the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and, you know, here are these poor benighted souls running around and superstitious and, you know, thought control by the kind of monolithic church and so forth. And oh, thank God we left that behind with the Renaissance and then the Enlightenment. Well, there were a lot of people starting in the 19th century who started looking back and saying, uh-uh, wait a minute. Maybe we've been sold a bill of goods. Maybe the Middle Ages are our lost golden age. And so they began to romanticize the Middle Ages in all kinds of ways. And we're going to talk a lot about that in this course, because a lot of 19th and early 20th century literature, and God knows even contemporary culture, uh, contemporary with us culture, uh, goes back and provides us with all kinds of images, attractive images, appealing images of the Middle Ages. I mean, think of our movies, you know, that have to do with the Middle Ages. Not only earlier movies, you know, King Arthur and uh, his court and uh, Connecticut Yankee and the King Arthur's court and uh, all of those movies about uh, knights and ladies and jousts and warfare and courtly love and all of the rest of it. But that continues, you know, into our own time. You know, with very popular movies like Braveheart, like uh, the, the movie King Arthur, uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Tolkien was a professor of, of Anglo-Saxon and, uh, and Old Norse, Old Icelandic literature. He was a medievalist by profession. And so, of course, when he wrote those books, he was drawing directly on Old English and Old Icelandic literature for the basic storylines, developments of characters, you know, and conflicts, and so on, and so on, and so on, in all kinds of very interesting ways. So if you were to read that early medieval literature, which is wonderful stuff, by the way, um, you know, you would see what Tolkien was doing with it. And it's, it's really very wonderful what he did with it. So anyway, Starting in the 19th century, there is this renewed interest in the Middle Ages and taking the Middle Ages seriously and saying, wait a minute. You know, maybe there was something very, very important and valuable back there that we have lost. Yes, we've gained a lot, but maybe we've lost a lot too along the way. And so there was a tendency often to go back and idealize the Middle Ages. Well, seeking out a place like Tintern Abbey would be part of that. You know, you're going to go out on a, on a day trip. Where are you going to go? Oh, let's go to that old ruined medieval monastery down the road there by the river. Why? Why would you do that? Unless there were some kind of pull, some kind of attraction in this. OK. Five years have passed. Five summers with the length of five long winters, 
And again I hear, because I'm out here again now, again I hear these waters. There's a river that runs down there. It's, it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Uh, rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs. The, you know, the river is cutting actually through uh, an area where, you know, how rivers will, often enough, if the rock formations are of the right kind, will cut over thousands of years, you know, through mountains and whatnot. And so there are high hills and, and even cliffs on either side of the river. That on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion. Notice that when I look at the scene, what I'm interested in is the thought that that impresses on me. Notice the relationship between objectivity and subjectivity. That's what this poem is ultimately about in many ways. See, that, that what is interesting for Wordsworth about his experience in and his knowledge of the external or objective world is what that does to him subjectively, what that does to him inside. It was really the romantics who got us convinced that we are better people for going on trips out into the country, if, I mean, if we're city dwellers. That's actually something that will improve us and improve us as people. Well, how could that be? Well, read on. And connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day has come when I again repose here, under this dark sycamore, and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, He's looking at the farms. Okay, he's up on the hillside and he's looking down on the farms. Which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild. Now that is the way they would look if you're up above. Have you ever been up in a high place looking down on farmland and you can see the market, you know, the, the fences or the hedgerows or whatever there are that mark off the different fields of the different farms? That's what he's looking at. And they look like just little lines because he's up high now looking down on them. Okay, um, these pastoral farms, this is a pastoral setting in the sense of being out there in nature, that's one of the meanings of the word pastoral. But the other meaning of the word pastoral is that the Latin word pastor means shepherd, means shepherd. Green to the very door. I mean, unlike most parts of London, unless you're real rich and you can afford to have, you know, an expansive lawn. <coughs> you know, most people have concrete up to their doors or flagstone up to their doors. And wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees with some uncertain notice, as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods or of some hermit's cave, where by his fire the hermit sits alone. The hermit being an image of somebody who is a kind of contemplative, who lives out there in nature. These beauteous forms. Okay, we've got a break now. Here he's describing the setting. But now he's actually going to start exploring what that physical setting does to him subjectively. These beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye. 
okay? Um, you know, what, what does a blind person see? I mean, if, if a blind person were to be told about a landscape, the person might have some notion of what that was, but wouldn't be able to experience it in the same way that someone with sight could. But often lonely rooms, often lonely rooms, this is in the intervening five years since I was out here last, often lonely rooms amid the din of towns and cities, you know, carriages and horse-drawn wagons and whatnot clattering around and people shouting and, you know, running here and there and so forth. I have owed to them, I have owed to them these beauteous forms of nature out here in the woods. I have owed to them in hours of weariness sensation sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration. See, these are the feelings now being recollected in tranquility when he's lying around or sitting around or whatever he's doing in his room in the city. And this is a tranquil restoration. Just thinking about what it was like being out there in the country and having that great experience brings to him a kind of restoration. Feelings, too, of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence, on that best portion of a good man's life. And what is that best portion of a good man's life? His little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. That's very interesting. That's been very often quoted, by the way. It's a very famous passage. Notice the experience then in nature is morally improving. We come away from that better people. And as we reflect back on it and re-experience it in certain ways in tranquility, that restores us and restores the best parts of us. Okay? And they have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life. The best portion of a good man's life, or a good woman's life, is not doing great deeds. It's the little everyday things. It's the little everyday things. That's the best portion of a good man or woman's life. Little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love. Those are the things that constitute goodness, as far as Wordsworth is concerned. Nor less, I trust, to them I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime, that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. That serene and blessed mood in which the affections, the f older word for feelings, in which the affections or feelings gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood Almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about how sometimes, may not happen very often, but sometimes we may experience something that just so carries us up out of ourselves that we forget who we are and where we are and what we are. And at least for a moment, we have entered into some kind of transcendental role or realm. 
okay? Um, you're walking along the, uh, the seashore. It's dark. And then if you've ever done this, you know what happens next is you have what people call the false dawn because it looks like it's dawn, but it's not really the dawn yet. And then the dawn begins and the dawn comes in all of its glory. What Homer called rhododactylos eos, rosy fingered dawn. You see those rosy colors and pastel colors spreading out over the vastness of the sky and the sea. And let's just say that you could just get so caught up in the experience that time would pass and you wouldn't even be aware of time passing. That you wouldn't even be aware of who you were or where you were. You're just totally caught up in that experience. That's what Wordsworth is talking about here. I mean, it doesn't have to be by the seaside, but, but something, some kind of experience like that. And he's talking about an experience in nature. Why? Aha. Let's see. If this be but a vain belief, I mean, criticize me if you will, say this is just a vain belief. If this be, be but a vain belief, yet, oh, how often darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world, the fever of the world, you know exactly what the fever of the world is if you drive on one of our freeways, right? That's the fever of the world. Have hung upon the beatings of my heart. How oft in spirit, not literally, because I'm away someplace else, how oft in spirit have I turned to thee, O Sylvan, why? Silva is a Latin word for woods, forest. And the why is the why river. O Sylvan, why? Thou wanderer through the woods. He's addressing the the, the river now that wanders through the woods. How often has my spirit turned to thee? Okay. Okay. And now, with gleams of half extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. Because after all, the memory does tend to fade, doesn't it? But now I've gone back, and so here is the, the picture right in front of me all over again, as it were. While here I stand not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there's life and food for future years. See the argument by analogy he's making here? Just as five years ago he had a great experience out here, and he now has learned that in the five years he's been away, that experience has been life and food for future years, the next five years. Now also, by analogy, he argues, I'm not only having a pleasant experience right now, but it is also pleasant for me to reflect on the fact that this is going to nourish me for a long time to come, when I've gone far away from Tintern Abbey. And so I dare to hope, though, change no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills. When what was he like then? Like a row. I bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by. <coughs> when he was a boy, it's like an animal just sort of frolicking in the middle of, of nature. You ever watched animals just being playful? You know, it's wonderful. 
to me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. A cataract is a waterfall. Haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite. That's a very interesting metaphor. Notice he doesn't say a mental impression, an idea. They were an appetite. An appetite is something that wants to be fulfilled, right? A feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. In other words, I didn't have to bring to bear on this some kind of idea to make this really impressive. Oh, isn't this interesting because this is an example of a really uh, uh, interesting geological formation or something like that. Okay, I just experienced it. That time has passed. That time has passed. And now there's going to be a little nostalgia about that, that he can no longer experience things that way. That time has passed, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures, you know, the wild, confused feelings that somebody very young might feel. Okay? Uh, there may be some advantages in growing older, but one of them, for Wordsworth, is not the ability to have this kind of a spontaneous relationship with nature. Not for this faint eye, nor mourn, nor murmur. He's, he, you know, he's really protesting too much, as Shakespeare says. You know, I'm not complaining, I'm not complaining. Other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe, abundant recompense. Okay? He's trying to cheer himself up. It's true I can't have that kind of experience any longer. But I have gotten something very important instead with my maturity. For I have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still, sad music of humanity. Nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and sub subdue. And I have felt, and this is one of the most important and famous passages in all of our literature. This is quoted everywhere. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky, and in the mind of man. It's not just out there, it's also in the mind of man, in the psyche of man. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things and all objects of all thought. Notice, subject as well as object. And rolls through all things and rolls through all things. See, he has experienced, and now he can contemplate how in those moments of transcendence, what he has been experiencing is a great spiritual force that rolls through everything. Not just through nature conceived of as something out there, objectively, but me too, right here, subjectively. And I experience my connection with nature in an intimate, and as the Romantics constantly said, an organic way. Therefore, am I still a lover of the mountains and the woods and mountains, the meadows and the woods and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive, 
well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense the anger the, the anchor of my purest thoughts the nurse the guide the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being moral being and notice that knowledge is not simply something which is empirical knowledge of the objective world I too half create with my own psychic subjective apparatus that which I perceive and that which I experience that's because whatever is outside me is in some genuine and true sense also what is inside me if I only let myself realize it the problem with our ordinary ways of thinking is that we deliberately and systematically and even methodologically have cut us off from that experience and therefore from that realization of the organic connectedness of us with all existence all existence okay so notice that it is through his analysis of his subjective experience that he comes to a whole new understanding not simply about himself but of what we are sometimes pleased to call objective reality as well and the relations between subjective and objective reality in other words this is a passage to knowledge not through objective study but through subjective experience and that's something new that the idealist philosophers and romantic writers are bringing to our culture okay